Chase Thomas podcast. The Chase Thomas podcast. <laughs> um, my nephew needs me to record. See, I hate. I already hate it. I hate it. All right, hello, and welcome back to another episode of The Full Ride here on the Chase Thomas Podcast, where I'm still the aforementioned Chase Thomas coming to you live from Knoxville, Tennessee, Everything School HQ, down there in Tequila, Georgia. My good friend, fellow University of North Georgia alumni, Matt Green, is here. Matt, good evening, sir. How are you? Good evening, sir. It is uh, it is good to be back. I'm uh, I'm super excited about this, uh, this slate we got this week. Best weekend mm. of college football, maybe? Uh, thus far for sure, but I, I think we got some other big slates coming down the pike here. So this is a good one. I mean, by and large, uh, Tennessee gets sandwiched in there at four o'clock. What, what time does Georgia play? Oh, it's a seven o'clock UAB. Mm. They, they gave Georgia another night home game. They're like, Hey, you guys want <laughs> night home games? Here you go. Like, no, we want like a legit SEC night home game. But, mm. but yeah, UAB Trent Dilfer hyping up, uh, Georgia and SEC, you know, hoping that, Maybe Kirby Smart will uh, will take the foot off the gas pedal a earlier. I don't know. We'll see. Well, your eyes are going to be mixed. I mean, Notre Dame, uh, Ohio State, right at that same time. It works out for me with Tennessee with uh, four thirty and like Clemson and Florida State at noon. And we'll get into the slate here, but I'm yeah, glad like that next week, yeah. like next week's perfect as like a Georgia fan. It's like there's mm. a great noon slate, a great like night slate, and then Georgia Auburn's kind of the only game at three thirty. It's like you get yeah. to keep your eyes on everything. But yeah, that's the one bummer. Ho I'll uh, hopefully have like a two TV setup um, going on, on Saturday to be able to watch Notre Dame and um, yeah, a couple of other good games uh, late too. Penn State, Iowa, so. Well, uh, we'll get into all of it for sure. That's one of those. You get the updates and you watch the nine minute recap on uh, on YouTube the next day. Uh, so is that the question I have? I'm sure we can look this up. Is that Gary Danielson and um, Brad Nestler? Because that's the be, 730 right? CBS. Yeah. Usually whenever it's the 330 and the 730 CBS, usually have Nestler and Danielson on the uh, on the on the double on the second one end of the double header, you know? Well, it makes so, sense. I mean, I Danielson's know. a Purdue guy. Like, he's going to be right at home uh, when they make the jump <laughs> to the Big Ten. But so Ole Miss, Ole Miss, Alabama, I don't know. I would I would be surprised. I'll have to see. I'm sure you can look that up. Yeah, I don't know. It, it'll be fine, whoever it ends up being. I need answers. He, he needs answers. Uh, folks, uh, we have a big slate, as Matt alluded to here. But he's also got something uh, each week, Matt's minute for something that Matt's been thinking about. Um, that we're going to add to this very program, sir. Matt's minute week one. What do you what do you have for us here? I think we're going on week four here, but well, week uh, one of your first, first edition. Yes. Um, I feel like you hyped it up a little too much this week. I don't necessarily have a grind my gears going on here, but I noticed uh, some teams that have something in common, sir. I noticed. Uh, what do you think these teams have in common? Duke Blue Devils, North Carolina Tar Heels, Kansas Jayhawks, UCLA Bruins. Who's my fifth one? Oh, man. Duke, North Carolina, K Kentucky Wildcats. That's my mm. fifth one. What do those teams have in common, sir? They're all college basketball blue bloods. They are all college basketball blue bloods. You might say all these schools have four more or more national championships in college basketball. That's what they all have in common. But they have something else in common, sir. Mm. They're all these teams are three and zero on the college football field. So, Ooh. of all of these uh, basketball schools, you might say, but mm -hmm. but not limited to. That's interesting. Who, I, yeah, go ahead. Who's going the furthest? Uh, undefeated. Off the dome, I would say Kentucky because their schedule is the easiest. That you might think that, but Florida that game just got a little more interesting. I think I think Kentucky, and then after Florida, Kentucky's got Georgia. So That's I think true. Kentucky goes at best five and zero. Oh. I look at Duke's got Notre Dame in week five. Kansas Kansas has what BYU this week, and then yeah. I think Texas next week. Four and zero is probably at best for them. North Carolina, I think North Carolina's the one here that's got some actual staying power. Okay, they uh, I I mean they could be on upset alert this week. Who knows in North Carolina? You never know. 
uh, what you're going to get. But I think they have, after week five, I think they play Miami, and that's probably mm. the first, like, real test. But they're one of those teams that it's hard to say, like, it's hard to say who's going to give them a good game because you just never know kind of if, if the defense is going to show up. But, but yeah, I, uh, I found this interesting. Well, to this point, they've drubbed South Carolina, barely beat App State in overtime, drubbed Minnesota. So we're on the pinball and they're at Pitt. And Pitt's coming off an embarrassing loss. Like, I would say it's that over 50%. That game feels odd. dangerous, yes. though, right? Yeah, that's why I'm just like, North Carolina's a full stay away. Syracuse is good um, to this point in Miami. Like, I, yeah, I don't know. I would just stay away from UNC. UNC looks like they could be a top 10 team. And then they also look like they're like an unranked. 32nd best team in the country week to week like they it, they're just a really frustrating team I, I have no idea what to make of North Carolina at this point yeah that's true um and to shout out to Syracuse they're not a yeah. blue blood but they're uh they're up there one of the better college basketball programs of all time but um and also got a college basketball trivia question for you sir okay. um who are the other two schools that have more four or more national championships in basketball that I did not name just now. Wait, say that question one more time. So I I named UCLA, mm-hmm. Kentucky, mm. North Carolina, Duke, and Kansas. All of those schools have four more national championships in basketball. Mm. Who are the only other two schools that have more than four? And I will give you a hint, both of these schools have five. I'll give you one more hint. One school won all of theirs before 1988, and one school won all of theirs after 1988. Oh. Michigan State? Incorrect. Hold on. I'll give you one more guess. Villanova? Incorrect. And I think 85 was the Army's first gotta one. Army's got to be the won. before 88. Indiana. Indiana. The Hoosiers, mm-hmm. man. Forgetting the Hoosiers. And then the more recent one, I did believe, did they just win the national championship this year? Uh, oh, UConn? the Yukon Huskies. Mm. So that's our that's our college basketball minute for the uh for the podcast. Mm. Okay. It, whenever it's weird in like the pre nineteen eighty, I always go like military school, and then you have Coach K during that time, and it's always a safe bet of like who won a college football national title a hundred years ago. Probably a military school. Um, UCLA is a pretty good bet too. Yeah. When you're going anything old, it's like just the probability. Yeah, they probably won the championship that year. Matt Green, um, before we do our pick we released our top 25 uh, college football rankings this week uh, that you put together. Got some interesting insight. Uh, what uh, was the most fascinating or a hardest part uh, in your top 25 this week, sir? Well, I didn't catch as much, as much blowback with my top 25 this mm. week uh, from the listeners. Maybe uh maybe because they're trusting me a little bit. I got a little pushback mm. from Tennessee fans in my power rankings last week. And uh, you know, don't want to toot my own horn here. I'm a humble guy, but uh mm. I think that I think I think I was proven right a, a little bit there. But um what what did you say stands out about my tw- top twenty five? Like you think yeah. an, an, uh according to most people? Yeah, well, well when you put it together, for, what where did you struggle the most and what do you think has the most opportunity to move around after this week? There's definitely going to be some opportunities. I think Ohio State Notre Dame, that's a game we can learn a lot this week. Mm-hmm. But um right now, I think unlike most people, I just I feel like the th- the, the big 3 and the Big 10 are just all one big entity like i Hmm. you can't really separate any of those teams to me like none of them have really played a team that you can really learn much from i think penn state going at illinois was like the biggest like kind of character type of game so far and illinois is just a physical team and that was just they pulled away like they they took care of business on the road um ohio state like they did that with indiana but i just feel like indiana is a really bad team personally so i i personally think Penn State right now is like my one. It's like Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan. Because Michigan, I don't really understand where they're getting like first place votes in the AP poll, to be honest. Like I can understand how like if George is just this unanimous number one back-to-back champion, just default, you just, yeah, whatever, they're still one. Michigan, or not Michigan, Texas and Florida State have been like the teams that have shown out that like if I'm not giving my number one vote to Georgia. I'm giving it to Florida State or Texas because they've got those big marquee wins. Like Michigan is like not even really looked good, like scoring like 
30 points against just some of these cupcakes. McCarthy throwing three interceptions a week ago. Like, I'm not really sure where the the hype is coming from Michigan other than just having them preseason number two and not changing your mind yet. But uh, I was a little shocked seeing the real polls of of them getting um, not that my poll is not real. This is this is re- this is as real as it gets. But um, in the AP poll, just shocked at how many first place votes Michigan's getting. I have them sitting at number six with Penn State, um, Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan right there at four, five, six, and then Georgia, FSU, and Texas one, two, three right now. I mean, I would have moved Florida State down. They'd be like seven or eight for me, probably eight. I think eight. Uh, yeah, I still. So you think... put all those Big Ten teams ahead yeah. of Florida State. I think if you That's put them on a neutral site right now, I think they'd all be favored over Florida State. Florida State almost lost uh, Boston College over the weekend. Um, that they, a lot's been made about their opener against uh, LSU. And it was good. Uh, they took advantage late uh, in the second half. They did what they needed to do. They're deep. Um, Jordan Travis though has been sneaky, kind of shaky, and he gets banged up in that game too. I don't know. I'm just less certain about florida state than i think a lot of other people are i would still like gun to my head today say penn state ohio state michigan uh are better than florida state and even texas who you have there too um and then here's one washington who i think has the best offense in the country right now i don't know what that looks like on a on a neutral side so i probably would have flipped washington and oregon because i think washington's looked like the best team in the pac-12 to this point What's funny is that I actually have like the big three and the big 10. I have like a big four chunk in the Pac-12. So after mm. after uh, Michigan, I, I've just been really impressed in Notre Dame so far this year. So I had Notre yeah. Dame at seven. And then I don't really know how to differentiate those top teams in the Pac-12 right now. Like I yeah. have I have eight Oregon, nine Washington, 10 USC, and 11 Utah. I just, I feel like all of those teams have been solid. We haven't even really seen the best version of Utah yet. Like we've seen this team playing with like multiple backup quarterbacks, like just kind of gutting out wins. So in that Florida win, you know, that, that even looks a little bit better now, especially with your backup quarterbacks. So, and the way they just kind of control that game from start to finish. So I, um, I'm not high on the USC hype train. Like, you know, there, there, all these teams, so many of these teams are going to have to play each other. So they're going to prove it on the field, but, um, yeah. I don't know the USC just still has the same concerns to me, just all offense, no defense. So, you know, I don't think they've really proven anything to this point, but yeah, Oregon and Washington is really a toss up. Like I think they've both looked uh, really impressive so far. I like it. Uh, Matt Green week. Four picks. Uh, let's quickly go through our pick them as we head into week four in Ohio State Notre Dame, kicking things off. Yes, sir. You you wanted to go through the scores? Yeah, where we're at. Let the, the listeners, standings? the good folks know where we stand heading into week four. All right. So, so far you have a two game lead against the spread, which is where it matters the most. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, winning the people money. You are 21 and 12 on the season quality winning percentage. Um, I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but you know, mm-hmm. it's not important right now. And I'm 19 and 14 overall. So, um, you know, I need to improve, but, but not too bad. Still a, a few games over 500. So we're feeling good. Um, but then overall, I'm sitting at 23 and 10, a game up on you overall. You're at 22 and 11. And Zeus with his home dogs of the week at four and one so far this season. So Zeus is is winning the people some money. There you go. Matt Green, where are we going first this week? We are going to go to where college game day is going to be this week. And I'm jacked for this one. Ohio State, Notre Dame, Fighting Irish are a three and a half point home dog in this one. How do you see this one going, sir? Man, this is a big test. I can't wait. This is the my favorite game of the day. Um, I went back and forth of like, is this my favorite or is it Clemson, Florida State? Because I think we're going to learn so much about these four teams on Saturday. And I'm glad it's not too early where there's going to be some rest there. No, this is a bit a month into the season. You need to, This is kind of who you are um, and who you're going to be the rest of the way here. Um, once you get to this, we're closing in on the middle point here of the college football uh, regular season. So you got to have your act together. It's not a neutral site, which is great. Um, I am very excited because it feels like they don't play very often. It feels like Notre Dame, Michigan happens a lot. Notre Dame obviously playing the ACC circuit and then they get USC, um, which will be another big one in a couple weeks here for Notre Dame. But 
Notre Dame is just quietly under the radar. They've played one more game than everybody um, to this point. So their stats are a little bit inflated, like they lead college football and touchdown passes to this point um, with 15. And they're really good in a lot of different ways. This is the most complete Notre Dame team I've seen in a really long time. I think this is a likable team. I've never seen this like universal respect from Notre Dame, um, from college football analysts, fans. And if like you talk with an SEC fan about Notre Dame right now, I think most are like, hey, Sam Hartman, they got a quarterback. Hey, they run the ball it's hard. Sam Hartman, he's yeah. captured America. But they like him. And I mean, look, Hartman's, he's already over a thousand yards to this year. Uh, no picks, which is huge for them in this game. Like Ohio State hasn't really been tested. They broke out a little bit uh, offensively last week, but Audric Estime is awesome, and they've got a stable of backs. Uh, but Trayvon Henderson, on the flip side for Ohio State's finally healthy, and we've been waiting for him to be healthy and what that adds to their their offense. Kyle McCord figures stuff out, and he's been named the permanent starter. So he had a big week. Arvin Harrison's healthy, and he's just – when he breaks out of his route, like you saw one play where he just runs by. Like you just don't even understand how he gets by these guys. Like the, he makes them look like high schoolers when he's on the field with them. So I'm curious to see what that matchup looks like if Notre Dame's going to be able to limit – Marvin Harrison, who is just the best receiver on the planet and is probably the best player in this game um, when he steps in the field here. So what it, what does that mean? But Estime has over 500 yards, five TDs at this point. He's just a he's just a horse, man. And he's been awesome. I'm curious to how this front because Ohio State's front seven has been really good uh, to this point. They have a, a lot of talent on the edge that I am curious how Sam Hartman's going to deal with that. Uh, but also Notre Dame's got good tackles and a good offensive line. Are they going to be able to hold up against this talented five-star laden uh, Ohio State defensive line? That's a matchup that I'm wanting to see and how that goes. Notre Dame first in passing first downs, Matt Green. So they have thrown the most first down passes of anyone in college football at this point. They're efficient through the air. They're third in running. They're second in 30 plus yard plays behind University of Washington. All it took was uh, Tommy Reese exiting the building as offensive coordinator for this Notre Dame offense to come together in a multitude of ways. But when you go through the stats and you go through what they've done to this point in the year, you're just like, damn, Notre Dame is just efficient and clean and good all across the board. And then you look on the other side and you're like, oh, Kyle McCord, what? He has the highest QBR in the Big Ten at 87.2? Okay. And then you think about the talent and you think about the firepower and you're like, Three and a half is a right because I think this is a coin flip. And I think this is going to be down to the wire. I think it's going to be similar to Georgia and Notre Dame and those classic battles. And that's what I'm hoping for is this comes down to the final possession. But similar to Georgia and South Bend, Matt Green, I think Ohio State pulls it out. Maybe it's Marvin Harrison has the game winning catch in the back of the end zone or something here. I think Notre Dame gives a it their one handed all. Terry Godwin tribute. Maybe, maybe I could see it. I just think. I'm going to bet on Ohio State here, and I think they ultimately win a high-scoring affair. I think this is going to be a lot more back and forth um, than folks think, and I'm going to say Ohio State 38, Notre Dame 30, Notre Dame 34. I'm going to say Ohio State covers. All right. Put it on the board. See, I um, when I look at this game, it feels like these two teams switched identities from a year mm. ago. Like Ohio State feels like the team that's just kind of basic offensively, but playing really good defense. Like Notre Dame is playing really good defense as well. I think these are like two of the top four defenses in the country so far in the country uh, through the first three games. But I look at this Notre Dame team, and I just it's it is Sam Hartman like. While while America does love him, like we could we could do a little less with the uh, with the rib necklace, and we don't need any more of the rib necklace. We could just we can just forget about that. Mm. Uh, uh, but I think Sam Hartman is just uh, he he adds a new dimension. Like Kellen Mond get or not Kellen Mond. What am I saying? Um, Ian Book. Mm. I I guess I don't know. That's a Freudian slip. Uh, similar type players. Ian Book gave you those glimpses sometimes of like being that dynamic quarterback that that Notre Dame needed, but he was a, a lot of it was you know his athleticism and not necessarily just how how great of an arm he had. And I think Sam Hartman just adds an element to Notre Dame that we really haven't seen. And and while and it doesn't look like they're they're not doing what they've always done too. You know, it's like sometimes you te a team finally gets the good offense and then now the defense has given up a points or something. 
um, which which can happen. But it feels like they're still solid defensively. They're solid at the lines of scrimmage. They're back. So I really I think I'm um this isn't is this isn't um Calvin McCord's first road start. He did start Indiana, and that's probably his worst start uh, to this point, and the only like real competition they've played faced to this point as well. I mean, Western Kentucky is like a good G five school, but let's be serious. So I think, um, I look at this game and I've, I've, I've confirmed with Zeus. This is, this is home dog of the week right here, sir. Notre oh, Dame wow. fighting Irish, getting it done. This is, a uh, this is going to be a big time win. Marcus Freeman against his alma mater. Give me the uh, fight. Irish because one thing that will not be like the 2017 Georgia game is the Ohio State fans are not going to be taken over this mm. stadium like Notre Dame has taken lengths to make sure that that never happens again that was like the most embarrassing thing in the history of Notre Dame football they've changed their ticket policy I think a couple years ago like more digital tickets and that sort of thing so Ohio State's not going to take over. It's not going to be a, a home game like it was for Georgia back in 2017. And I think uh, this is this is the the win that Marcus Freeman needed. So give me Notre Dame to win this one outright. Okay. Uh, we disagree right out of the gate here, Matt Green. Where are we going next? Right out of the gate, sir. Um, and we will go to another home dog. This one I'm also excited about. Florida State. At Clemson, Clemson is a one and a half point home dog, which is surprising. An unranked team facing the number what number two, number three team in the country, and they're only a one and a half point dog in this one. How do you see this game going? Oh man, this one I went back and forth on probably more than any other game this week. Um, Clemson's fourth in rushing first downs. Will Shipley's quietly been solid. Uh, they've rebounded pretty well. Like there were some some silliness uh in the charleston southern game and if you look at that box score it's pretty funny like i love uh shut down full cast shout out to uh those good folks they had a hilarious rundown of um just if you didn't watch the game in the box scores and it, it's just it's just really funny how that was a, a, a competitive contest between clemson and charleston southern for a little bit of time matt green but clemson's won seven straight in this series um this something i can't shake so clemson's really dominated and that's why i've been dubious before the year and picking clemson to win uh the acc again when people are jumping on florida state is like okay um can they beat clemson first can they get that monkey off their back and part of me just with what we've seen you lose um on the road at duke to open the year and you look really rough k Klubnik's been one of the worst quarterbacks in the acc this year it's not like he's gotten progressively better um Jordan Travis averts disaster last week in uh, Boston College, so um, he gets that. I also think it's kind of important that they just found a way to win. I think people just want clean, big wins every single win, uh, week when their team's good, and it's just like sometimes they're just going to have, um, as uh, Dan Rubin signed of uh, the Solid Verbal says, win your clunkers, and that's going to happen sometimes. It's just mainly you want to get out of there with a dub. You don't want to do what Tennessee did uh, on the road in the swamp on Saturday night. You want to, you want to do the, the opposite of that, uh, generally speaking. But look, uh, this was something I cool. I found was, uh, found on, uh, in one of the previews I was looking through was FSU Heisman winners through four games. Charlie Ward had 1,228 total yards, nine TDs, Chris Winky, uh, 1199 total yards and 10 TDs, Jameis Winston, uh, 12, uh, 1159 total yards and 14 TDs. Jordan Travis through three games, 835 total yards, nine TDs. So he has one game uh, less than the big three who won Heisman trophies for Florida State in the past. And he's going to eclipse those some of those numbers here, Matt Green, uh, following this Clemson game, unless there is an absolute disaster. Florida State also hasn't won uh, since 2014. Um, and that's still it's a long time, Matt Green. Uh, that's a time when they won the national title right before with Jameis Winston and they were number one in the country. Uh, they're right there. They're number two in your power rankings, Matt Green. The reason I bring all that up, Dabo early on, I mean, they were number 22. They weren't the powerhouse that they are now. Florida State was the powerhouse. Florida State barely won. They got a dub, 23-17 in overtime. I, all this to say, I think the tides are turning. I think this is a monumental win for Florida State and the Seminoles as they take over the top spot 
in the ACC this season and maybe for the next couple years. I think Florida State gets the job done. Clemson loses at home to Florida State. I'm going to say Florida State wins 27-23. 27-23. All right. Florida State, put it on the board. It's interesting you brought up... uh... Florida, Tennessee, because I think there's a lot of parallels here with this Mm. game and Florida, Tennessee from a week ago. Florida got embarrassed week one on the road. Uh, Clemson got embarrassed week one on the road. Left for dead. You know, no one one believed in this team. Mm. Florida State, just like Tennessee, cannot win in Clemson. They've uh Clemson or we all know about Tennessee hasn't won at Florida since like 2003. Florida State's won one time in Death Valley since 2001. One in one in nine in their last ten, and that one was Jameis Winston in 2013 when they won the national championship. So that's the, the your national championship team was the only team that that could win in Death Valley. So I just look at this game and. This is kind of like Tennessee, Florida State, if not now, when? Like, Clemson hasn't been unranked coming into this matchup probably in, what, 15 years? Like, it's since Dabo got the job. So, I think this is a golden opportunity for Florida State. But I also kind of feel like everyone's counting out Clemson right now. And you look at that Duke game, like, 28-7, yeah, like, Duke beat them easily. But, like... They had like over 430 yards of offense, like missed or two blocked field goals, three turnovers. It's like everything happened that could possibly happen to to lose that game. And like you're saying, like the Charleston Southern game was what, like tied at halftime or something. And like that's probably the last time anyone was actually watching Clemson. They're like, oh shit, Clemson, they might lose. Like, what's going on, Dabo? And then they ended up winning easily, you know, and then no one really watched them play last week and they put up a 50 spot, right? So whatever that whatever you learn from that game. I just, this feels a lot like Florida, Tennessee. Like I'm saying, like, I don't think Clemson's a better team than Florida State. Like I, right now, I mean, call me crazy. I don't think Florida's a better team than Tennessee necessarily. I think it's just mm. home, home atmospheres. They do something. Teams playing with their backs against the wall, like, the Davo Swinney's entire reputation and legacy being put on the line for not going to the transfer portal. Something just tells me like Death Valley is going to be rocking. I like Clemson to uh, to shock the world and upset Florida State. And this will be a justified field storming, even though they do it every week in Death Valley. So wow. give me the Clemson Tigers, even though I got Florida State in my uh, in my two in my power rankings. But I don't know. There's something about there's something about that home atmosphere. Wow. I didn't see this coming. Yeah, Did we're not uh, see this coming. We're off to a hot start, sir. It's just Great. we're just getting started. Colorado at Oregon, is that where we're going next? That is where we're going next. Were you shocked by this spread? No. Oregon's at home 20 and a half point favorite in this one. Like I know Travis Hunter is out like I know this team just Colorado just went to overtime with Colorado State. Like, this isn't a great team by any means. It's a great story. Like, and they are a very good team. We don't we don't know if they're a great team yet. I don't think they're a great team. But what do they have? Like 12 turnovers, 10 turnovers, I think they've they forced in the first three games. That's not always sustainable. But if you are doing that, that's changing games. So Oregon's a team. Have they I, they may have yet to turn the ball over, I think, on the season. Um, but how do no, you see they have this not turn the ball over to this point? So something's got to give there or, mm. um, but I, it's, it's all going to be on Shador Sanders and that's, that's just a lot to ask. So, um, I, I don't think they're going to win by three touchdowns because I don't think, uh, I don't think Oregon can really stop this offense enough to, to win by three touchdowns. But I, I think it, I could see it being a, you know, a 41, a 41 30 type of game. And, you know, and, and Oregon kind of wins wins by multiple scores, but not but not by three touchdowns. Interesting. You said it comes down to Shador. I don't think so. I think Shador's gonna be fine. It's not a Shador issue. It's a complete talent issue. That this Colorado defense stinks. And this Colorado it took a ninety eight yard drive from their two in crunch time for Colorado to survive at home 
against a bad Colorado State team that I understand they got up for it. It was a it turned into a humongous rivalry game. We all watched it. Nine point three million people watched it. They're ahead of schedule. Colorado's three and zero. Travis Hunter, their best player, is not going to be available this week and the next couple weeks, which really sucks, especially when you get USC the following week. But I don't think they're winning either of these games with or without Travis Hunter. Shador Sanders is absolutely a great player, one of the five best quarterbacks in this country. This is where like the Heisman stuff when people are like, he's in the Heisman. It's like, no, because he's this is still a seven and five team. Like this is now I thought they were gonna be on a March to six uh this year before the season. And I thought they could maybe get six and six, and that's a huge win. Now you're looking at like seven and five, eight and four is probably the win. It's kind of like where Tennessee was their first year with. Hey, Mike don't Bull you put company. a ceiling on them, sir? You don't even know. We don't even know where this team could go. Well, the problem is the reason I'm putting a ceiling, and I'm not even put one. Pac-12 is the best conference in college football right now. That's a problem. Like Colorado's, like if you're playing the Big Twelve or you're playing the ACC, like is Colorado the best ACC team? Maybe I don't know. Fully healthy, like could they give Florida State and Clemson a run for their money? Yes, I think so. Well, not so, even ACC. They're going to be in the Big 12 this year or next year, and they might be the best team in the Big 12. Next year. Yeah, not this year. I, I don't think they can touch Texas, but we'll yeah. we'll save that for um, another conversation. But what I'm saying is, ultimately, look, Bo Nix is actually the big key here. He has not been on the Heisman radar. Like, he's getting all the billboards. You see those on Twitter everywhere. Like, he's all over the place. He's got good NIL marketing uh, to this point. He didn't have to stay. He came back. Oregon's really good. They've dropped some bad teams to this point, but this is the Bo Nix Heisman game where all the hype, all the eyeballs are going to be on Oregon and Colorado this weekend because everybody's eyeballs are on Colorado apparently until uh, things go right. That's why I think this is such a huge moment for Bo Nix. And I think this is such a great situation for him because Colorado's pass defense is atrocious. Bo Nix should eat this group alive. Shador's going to have some problems. Oregon 16th in passing defense to this point. He hasn't played like Nebraska gave him problems. Nebraska, if they had a semi-competent offense, they're in that game until the end and they don't fold in the second half. Nebraska has got one of the top five defenses in the country to this point. They're aggressive. They gave Colorado a lot of problems on the road. What I'm saying, I think Oregon is just a complete team. I think they're one of the 10 best teams in the country. I think the absence of Travis Hunter is going to make things really, really difficult for Shador Sanders to do a whole lot. And he's going to, it's going to take a lot of heroics and the heroics that you can do against Colorado state. I don't think you're going to be able to do on the road in a hostile environment at Oregon. This is an interesting game for a multitude of reasons, but like you mentioned, Oregon hasn't turned the ball over yet. Like Nebraska beat themselves in that game against Colorado um, early on. And this is not going to be an Oregon team that beats themselves. Like they're going to, it's going to take a flawless game from Colorado just to cover. I think um, Colorado state quarterback last week, uh, Braden Fowler and Nicole Nicolosi. He threw for like nearly 400 yards on this pass defense. Like now we're talking about Bo Nix here. They're sixth in long scrimmage plays uh, this year. Sixth. Colorado is also fourth in turnover margin. So something they've utilized really well through three weeks I don't think it's going to be a factor here because Oregon's a sound football team that's not going to turn the ball over and not going to give Colorado those opportunities. All of this smells to me why the line is 20 and a half and why folks might be surprised by that. I'm not. I think Colorado is a good team. They're a top 25 team, but they're not where Oregon, Washington, Utah, and USC are at the present time. So I just think it's going to be one of those things where you just get blasted a couple times. You win. You've won a lot early on. You, you're going to a bowl game. That's great. But I don't think this game's actually close. And I'm interested to see how it goes on national television. And if it's like 42-17 Oregon in the early fourth quarter, what does it look like? What is? I'm excited to see what this Colorado team looks like when they are faced with adversity. And kind of what I spoke to is like, it's not that I'm rooting for it. It's just they're not going 12-0. So I want to see what happens when they I are I think you're rooting with. for it. No, I, like, I love watching them play. Like I, Shador is a dude. I want Shador on the Falcon next year. What I'm saying is like they are going to face adversity. I want to see what this looks like when they face adversity. Do they come together? Do they bounce back? Do they get through this tough time without Travis Hunter? I'm just curious what all this looks like because it's easy to celebrate and have all this fun when you're winning football games. But if you go and you get outscored by a combined 100 points from USC and uh, Oregon in back-to-back weeks, like it just changes, changes a lot. So I'm curious, as someone who just watched this team go down to the swamp and get just smacked by an inferior opponent it just it changes the vibe losing changes vibes very very quickly so <laughs> i'm just very curious what it ultimately looks like but i'm gonna take oregon f- give me oregon 49 
Colorado 20 here. Okay, yeah, and um, I think Oregon's just a bad matchup for Colorado at the end mm-hmm. of the day. Like, I think USC, especially at home, is, like, a much better matchup. Yes. Like, Caleb Williams is obviously a superstar, but... Except they're playing that game at 9 a.m. Offense versus offense. Like, n- no defense is going to be played. Like, TCU and Colorado State had 500 yards of offense against yeah. this Colorado defense, so... It's going to be tough. Yeah, I think, what did I say? I don't know. I think 45, 28, something like that. Um, so I think it's a easy win, but I think Colorado does cover uh, the big spread. This is the one I probably struggled the most with. Our uh, prime time 730 CBS. We got Iowa at Penn State, the whiteout game. Penn State's a 14 and a half at that half number that you know that that that's what that's what's giving me a little issue 14 and a half for penn state how do you see this game going this is like my lock of the week lock of the week i was covering this like mm. everything about this screams an iowa cover penn state's offense isn't quite there yet they're not quite firing on all cylinders first big uh just stupid iowa situation for drew aller and his young penn state career um, we've seen what I was done on the road in Happy Valley and at home against the Penn State Nittany Lions in years past. Their defense is not what it was. It's not like you're dealing with the two uh, two years ago Iowa defense that rivaled uh, Georgia with their takeaways and just not giving up any points. But they're still uh, top 20 defense. They're 18th in the country. Penn State's actually better at 13th. Um, but this is going to be close, and I got the biggest reason for you. They're past 100th in every single explosive pr- play metric that you look at for Penn State at this point. The defense is forcing a lot of takeaways. I think they'll force a lot of takeaways from Cade McNamara and I was going to have a lot of problems moving the ball at all against uh, Penn State. Here's the problem. There's no explosive plays to be had to this point for Penn State. And this is kind of why I'm still just kind of like, mm, until you beat Iowa, uh, what happens when Ohio State and Michigan have some explosive plays, specifically Ohio State, because I think they're actually a bad matchup for Penn State this year based on what I've seen to this point. But what I am saying, this is going to be close because Penn State's not going to pull away with any big plays. Their offense isn't there yet. The explosion's not there, so they can't put Iowa in a hole. So they're going to go down into war with Iowa. This is going to be on the ground. I think there's going to be some turnovers. I think this is going to be ugly. I think both defenses play well, but I think Iowa covers, and I wouldn't be surprised if Iowa went outright because this has all the Mm. makings of just an absolute slot fest. And Penn State feeling good, like we're the cream of the crop in the Big Ten. And here comes little old Iowa just trying to ruin their season ruin uh penn state getting to that next level i'm not picking penn, iowa to win outright because it's on the road at happy valley in a whiteout but i do think iowa covers and i think it's going to take uh every last bit for penn state to survive this one so give me penn state 20 iowa 17 okay uh, penn state or iowa um mm. so penn state is 17 and 14 overall in this series Kirk Franklin, Kirk Franklin, different Franklin, James Franklin. I'm getting my first mm. names messed up tonight. James Franklin is f- four and two versus Kirk Ferentz. There's, mm. there's the Kirk. There's where my mind was. Um, but I was one and two straight in this series, 2021, 2020 and in 2021. Back in, if you go back to 2021, Cade McNamara starting at Michigan at Penn State. 19 for 29, 217 yards, three touchdowns, no picks. Michigan went on the road, beat Penn State 21-17. I think, was that your exact score? 21-17, the other way around? I did just say 2017. So, Cade McNamara has done this before. He's been at Penn State, but I think this is a different Penn State team. I think this team is a little bit, you know, they have a little bit of an edge that they haven't had in recent years. And Drew Aller, I don't think we've seen, like you said, we haven't seen how good this offense can be yet, but Iowa still doesn't have an offense. And this Penn State defense is just nasty. So I don't see Iowa scoring like more than 10 points in this game. So I don't think I don't think it's going to take a lot. Like I, I feel like I see this being a game that might be 10 to 10 in the third quarter or something like that. But I think I think Penn State does get it done, and I think they pull away because I mean this is a whiteout. Like this is going to be a rowdy environment. This isn't some noon kickoff. Like Iowa going to come in and Penn State's taking them lightly or anything. Like this is going to be just a. I don't know the I don't know the, the stats on. I know they're not undefeated under whiteouts, but I know they win more than they lose. And 
I feel like this is going to be like a 27-10 or something like that. And I think Penn State uh, does take care of business. I, like, I don't think the offense is, is great, but I don't think it has to be to beat Iowa. I think if you just, mm. you know, play field position, let that defense get a turnover or two, like put your put your offense in good field position, I think uh, I think Penn State does uh, does uh, get it done in this one and, and covers. Oh, okay. We are disagreeing a lot. One of us is going to pull away this week in a multitude should, of ways here. It should be interesting for sure. Um, the next one, crazy that it's that this is fifth on our list, to be honest. Ole Miss at Alabama. And Alabama's a six and a half point uh, favorite in this one at home. Lane Kiffin just couldn't be more confident. Just. Talking all kinds of trash this week. Are we gonna buy into it like Saban? He he's he's in such a good mood. He must know something, right? Like Lane Kiffin knows that he's gonna be able to beat him. He also did the whole get your popcorn ready thing, and they lost by like fifty that game. So, I uh, we'll we'll see how that works out. But I look at this Alabama. I don't know what they're doing with this Jalen Milrow situation. It doesn't make any sense at all to me. It, it feels like, like, is Nick Saban worried about what the fans are saying? Was it was it legit the Faton Bauta game where he was just like, look, you want to see what this guy can do? Look, both of these guys are trash. We can't win anything with these. All right, Milrow's the guy. It's not like Milrow had a good week of practice. They announced this on Monday. Like, so it was just so odd to me that Milrow's just not going to play a snap versus South Florida. The, the offense just looks awful the whole game. And then you're like, yeah, I guess he's the best guy. So I think Milrow, while he's being like treated like he was the problem in the Texas game, like he was not the issue. Unfortunately for Alabama, he was not the number one issue. And I think as long as they design a game plan for this guy, like he's a flawed quarterback if we're talking about him as a pro prospect. But we've seen plenty of guys that are flawed passers be really successful in the college game. Like you have to des th call some design runs for him. Did they call a designed run for him one time in the Texas game? Like this guy's like the best athlete on the field. Like, so I think while the Alabama, you know, I I'm loving to talk about the dynasty being over and everything. They're not at rock bottom. The dynasty might be over winning national championships, but like I said, when the season was starting, there's going to be a lot of teams that they can bully, like that they're, they can out talent. It's just in those big, biggest games, the quarterback's got to make the plays. I think Ole Miss is the type of team they will be able to bully. And I don't I don't see Ole Miss just scoring points like they've scored the last few weeks against this Alabama defense. So I think Alabama's got their back against the wall. Nick Saban, you know, it's a Dabo situation too here, except for they actually have more talent than their opponent. So I think um, Alabama, I like them to win this game and cover the points. I, I think a lot of people are, are picking Ole Miss, but I'm not, I'm not ready for Ole Miss yet. We agree here, Matt Green. I think this oh, is one of Oh, I'm things. shocked about this one. I thought you were going to pick Ole Miss. Here's the problem for Ole Miss. This is like a Saban legacy game. Like with the amount of stuff that Lane Kiffin's already thrown out with, is it Robinson, is it Kevin Steele talking? Uh, Alabama obviously struggling to get out with the dub late uh, on the road at South Florida, losing their last home game to Texas in an embarrassing, embarrassing fashion late. Uh, and that one, uh, Bob just completely fumbling the quarterback situation, who that's going to be realizing you had a mistake. You go back to Milrow now. I'm going to guess they are going to have a better game plan for how to use Jalen Milrow to this point. I think we're going to see a more competent offense at this point. I don't think the explosive plays, you're just flipping a switch here. But I do think uh, Nick Saban also knows Pete Golding very, very well from the last couple of years. My gut tells me this is actually like a Nick Saban statement game. Because remember, Ole Miss had this game close and they were driving with the ball to either tie or win uh, when they had a turnover on downs and Bama took over late uh, last year in Oxford. So it was a close game and it came down to a one score situation. I don't think that's what's going to happen here. I'm going to ride out with Saban at the very end. If you lose this game, a lot changes and suddenly Bama's in a lot of trouble um, in terms of where they're going. Then you're suddenly looking down the barrel with LSU still on the schedule and M still on the schedule. You're looking at like eight and four is best case scenario. If you drop this game, um, and then we're just talking like, whoa, what what world are we living in with Alabama? And then right Chase now? Thomas might be right. This man might pull a Steve Spurrier, just step down midseason. I don't think he'll do that. But 
He might. He has the house. I've said forever, like Dion is the guy who will replace uh, uh, Nick Saban. I said that before it was cool. Like before Dion was even before at Colorado, it was cool. you were here on this program. I've said it for years that uh, he was the one who stood out to me as like the most likely person to keep up with the recruiting and everything else. That's a conversation for another day. I thought you were just talking about the next Aflac spokesman. I mean, he's already that, so <laughs> it's just a natural transition on the advertising uh, budget. But I just, I think I'm gonna ride with uh alabama here old miss is a top 10 team i like old miss they're second in the country in 20 plus yard plays uh alabama is actually tied with uh iowa and 10 plus yard passing plays which is awful like that there's just no explosion whatsoever when you're tied with iowa and explosive pass plays like you're you're probably not very good but i think they're going to run the ball a lot more and i think they're going to challenge this peak golding defense a lot i think this is a good Jalen miller bounce back game they're 38th in passing defense to this point. I think they'll limit what uh, Ole Miss has done. Uh, Ole Miss has banged up on the offensive front with Harris and Judkins and company. I still think Jackson Dart's legit. I still think Ole Miss is going to be a 9-3, 10-2 team in the in the SEC West. I just think this is bad timing for Ole Miss uh, because this is such an important game for Nick Saban and company. So give me, give me Bama 31, Ole Miss 20. Okay, I was actually thinking more of a more of a twenty four seventeen type of thing. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm I'm still not sold that this Alabama's o- offense is good. Like, it's I don't know. We'll we'll see. These shorter games are throwing me off. These possessions, I don't know. We'll see. You say that, but then you look at the side by side stats and like they're actually up. Scoring's up for some of these top ten teams. Like, I just. I don't know. I don't well, think we're... we're still early. Some of these cupcake games, it's hard to uh, compare that. I just don't think it's as crazy as people think it is i think the scoring should be pretty close like usc's averaging 59 oklahoma 55 oregon 58 i mean Ole oregon Miss scored 52. 81 points like they're not gonna score like what i'm saying is wazoo's played wisconsin and they're still averaging 48 florida states 47 like i don't know Notre dame's played we'll see four games, we'll see how it plays out yeah, I'm just saying it's not going to be as big as people think. Like, it's really not that big of a deal. You'll get used to it. It's fine. No, I think a lot of it's just the style that Alabama is going to want to play yeah. in this game, too. Um, so I think they do cover. So you have Alabama winning and covering as well. Mm. The Auburn Tigers going on the road. One of the few undefeated SEC teams left at Texas A&M um, back in 2021. Texas A&M actually got their first win over Auburn in College Station <clears throat> since joining the SEC. Auburn uh, used to own College Station for whatever reason, mm. but they did get that monkey off their back. I don't know if you remember this game last year. Like you would have thought Auburn won the Super Bowl. Like that was the Cadillac Williams game. Uh, I don't. I don't like to gatekeep or anything, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, that was an odd celebration. Whatever. It, they had fun doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, but A&M comes in this game. Seven and a half point favorite. I feel like A and M is just a lot of negative views towards A and M. Like they're like they're just like they've already been exposed of, as being a fraud. And I'm just not really sure where that's coming from. Like the Miami game, it's like yeah, the defense gave up 48 points. It's like that was a touchdown game, like into the fourth quarter. Like that was a a game where their offense was really good. They what they turned the ball over like three times like obviously you turn it over that's that's not a good thing but i think the the offense was not the problem so you look at you look at uh auburn like that cal game like that's their marquee win of the season right like going on the road to cal it's like there were seven total turnovers in that game like it was just one of the sloppier games you'll see like they they did get the win but it was just not very impressive so I, I'm just, I don't think Auburn's going to have enough offense. Like the defense has looked good so far this season, but I just don't think they have enough offense to, to, to hang with Texas A&M. So I think, I think A&M kind of wins this easily. Like, I think it's like a, a 30, a 38, 21 type of game. Like, I think, I just don't think they can hang with this offense. Interesting. Um, here's the thing with A&M and wait, did you say A&M covers or no? Yeah, they win it easily. Easily easily interesting matt green there's i'm just not like peyton thorne is the auburn's leading rusher right now like i just i I don't know i don't think that's a good thing but 
they got the multi-headed monster going a little bit. They have the transfer from USF, who's like their third back right now. Jarquez Hunter is actually still one of the best backs in the conference. We'll see uh, if they can get him going because uh, he was absent for the first game. Did he play in the Cal game? I feel like he didn't play in the Cal game uh, off the top of my head, but I could be wrong. Um, this is like your Peyton Thorn point is well taken. He's sneaky, not been great. And you look at it, a lot of those quarterbacks who come in post spring ball, they kind of struggle. Like Peyton Thorn was a late addition to Hugh Freeze's offense. And if you watch Michigan State the last couple of years, very different than what Peyton Thorn is walking into with Hugh Freeze and what he's his offense usually is. So there's a learning curve. And, and Jack West Hunter did play versus Cal. He had 11 okay. for 53 in that game. So there you go. Five yards to carry, just about. So um Jark West is a good player and i think uh he'll be uh he's someone to watch as the season goes on with some there's some carry on johnson vibes Jark West hunter um i think he's That's a bold. sneaky sneaky good player um all that being said Payton thorn 48th in yards per attempt at this point in the year a and m's actually eighth in the country and this is the under talked about problem with a and m we spent so much time this offseason wondering like is it going to be petrino's offense is it going to be uh jimbo's offense what is it going to be Here's what we've learned. Petrino's calling this offense. Connor Wegman's dealing. I think you can make the case he, Jalen Daniels, and Jackson Dart are the three best quarterbacks in the SEC this year. I don't even think it's really close with those three right now to this point. Uh, season's long. It can change. But I think Connor Wegman's going to be in that top three conversation no matter what. He is slinging. I think he has 10 touchdown passes at this point. He stood in the pocket, took a beating against Miami, and played really well. The AM offense is not the issue right now. The AM defense right now. DJ Durkin in the stat, like, it's bad. This AM defense got shredded by Miami on the road. This AM defense has not lived up to the hype. Mike Elko is not walking through that door. They need Mike Elko back in College Station because DJ Durkin has not been good. And this is going to be a problem because Auburn has played AM well in the past. But also, this is the kind of get right game for Auburn's offense because. DJ Durkin's defense is somebody you want to play uh, at this point in time. I think this is going to be a sneaky high-scoring game. Uh, Auburn's 13th in passing defense. They're going to limit what Connor Wegman and them want to do. I think this Auburn defense has a lot of talent on it, and they're getting better as the season goes on. They're a more balanced team. AM isn't really running the ball well to this point. They're th having to throw a lot. I think they're a lot more one-dimensional than Auburn is. You ready for this, Matt Green? No, nah, I'm not going to do the upset yet. But I do think mm. Auburn covers here. I think this Coward. is a sloppy. This is going to wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if Auburn wins this game, but I just can't do it. I can't put the the victory over Auburn uh Auburn here. So give me Auburn Auburn 39 and M 42. 39. Okay. Mm. Saying the losing teams score first. That's a that's a that's a faux pas in my book. Mm. 42-39. I don't see how this Auburn offense is going to score 39 points. Enter DJ Durkin, sir. All right. Put it on the board. A&M gets the win, but you like Auburn with the points. Um, keeping it moving, out to the Pac-12. Six ranked matchups in the mm. in this week. I think I heard it was the most since 2006 for one uh, individual weekend in September. So uh, it's exciting. We've got some some conference games, some non-conference games. UCLA Utah, we got in this one. Utah is a five-point dog or five-point favorite, I should say, at home. Cam Rising in this game. Cam has risen. Is that a? Is that? Uh, we'll edit that out. Um, we we get to see out. the. <laughs> Well, we've got to see the uh, the full Utah, like I said earlier. And I think if, if Cam Rising's healthy in this one, UCLA's looked good so far. Like I think they're like top five rushing offense in the country yes, so are. far this year. Um, and Dante Moore, five-star quarterbacks, looked pretty good so far. But I think we're going to get to see the best version of Utah this week with Cam Rising being healthy. And you've seen this defense has looked good regardless of who's been uh, under center. So... I think this is going to be a really competitive game, but I like Utah to win it by a touchdown, maybe like a a 30 to 23 type of game. So give me Utah to uh, win and cover at home. We disagree, Matt Green. Ooh. 
Here is my upset pick, uh, pick of the weekend here, sir. Utah's been playing with fire here a little bit. Haven't liked how Utah's played out of the gate to this point. It's hard to win three straight Pac-12 titles, Matt Green. Kyle Whittingham, most underrated coach in America. That all can be true. Here's the problem. Chip Kelly owns Mr. Whittingham. Chip Kelly and UCLA beat Utah a year ago. I understand DTR was there, a 19th year senior. We're going to see what happens at quarterback. You mentioned they're a top five rushing attack. They're going to gash this Utah defense. They are going to put up points against this Utah defense. I don't know what Utah is going to do when they get hit in the mouth in this way, when they're going to have to get into a scoring fight, because this game was high scoring last year and they lost. That's not how Utah wants to play football. Chip Kelly is going to bring Utah into a high scoring back and forth. UCLA, guess what? If Cam Rising plays and he struggles through the air, here's the problem with that. The Bruins only allowing two rushing yards per carry. UCLA sneaky has a good rush defense this year, Matt Green. I don't know about Utah's offensive line to this point. I don't know if they're going to be able to win that battle against UCLA up front. UCLA sneaky recruited a lot better, and Chip Kelly had done well in the portal. Here's the thing, too. Baylor was right there um, in that one. I, I think that was, a, that was a weird one. Baylor could have won uh, that game against Utah. Back and forth. They're just flirting with fire. UCLA, eight turnovers forced to this point. They're third in the country in rushing offense. They won, as I said, 42-32 last year. And if you forgot, Matt Green, it was Chip Kelly back when he was at Oregon who halted Kyle Whittingham's 16-game winning streak at Utah. There's something about Chip Kelly and his offense versus Kyle Whittingham and his defense. He wins this battle more often than not. He takes Kyle Whittingham and this Utah Ute team to a place they don't want to go, Matt Green. And that's a lot of points and a lot of tempo and a lot of back and forth. That is not the game you want to get into, even at home against the UCLA Bruins and Chip Kelly, who I think is actually a more under-talked-about coach in college football than Kyle Whittingham. Top 10 coach in the sport, one of the best of the last 20 years. He gets a dub and a big upset on the road at Utah this weekend. Give me UCLA 38, Utah 34. All right, put it on the board. Um, and for our Utah people out there, um, I'm not just going to let Chase Thomas get away with this. The last year was the first year that Chip Kelly has beaten Kyle Whittingham since he got to UCLA. So yes. 2018, 2019, 2021, Kyle Whittingham was uh, basically waxing that Chip Kelly. It was the early Chip you know Kelly what. years. You remember what he walked into? We're talking about a fully functioning Chip Kelly because he was fully functioning in Oregon and beat 2021, Kyle 2021, that's like year four. No. We're not, that's not fully functioning? No. Not quite there, Matt Green. Okay. Goes against the narrative. Toss it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I just wanted to get put some respect on Kyle Whittingham's name. Uh, for the listeners out there, he is three and two against Chip Kelly in his career. Um, it's risky. Now he's about to be five hundred after this weekend, sir. It is possible. Um, keeping it moving to the Pac Two Championship game. <laughs> this is all they have left. I hope they have someone has a trophy for this game. Mm -hmm. uh, we got Oregon State going on the road to Washington State. Cougars are a two and a half point home dog this week. And I really went back and forth with this one. Washington State, you know, Cam Ward, this offense has uh, looked pretty good so far. Solid win over Wisconsin. But I think uh, I think with DJ Uyunglele, how he's improved here with Oregon State and their rushing attack to go with it, I just I like Oregon State's balance. So I'm going to take the Beavers to uh, to go on the road and, and get the job done and be the Pac-2 champions, Mountain West, whatever you want to call their their conference they're in moving forward. But uh, yeah, give me uh, give me the Beavers. Wow. OK, here's the thing, Matt Green. We disagree again. Oh, man disagree again you don't just go into pullman washington and get a dub the what the wisconsin cougars found that out a couple weeks or wisconsin excuse me badgers found that out a few weeks ago uh when they tried to do just the thing oregon state's 13th in rushing we talk about dju he's been fine 
But this is still a ground and pound first operation, Jonathan Smith, running in Corvallis. This is still a we run and we run and we run. Steven Jackson didn't do everything he did. Jaquiz Rogers did not put in the time in Corvallis for them to be a pass first team. Now, this is run first university, Matt Green. That is their bread and butter and will continue to be their bread and butter. Those are some good ones. Pretty good. Cougars, third all time, or third all time, third in passing right now in the country. They're 31st in rush defense. Jake Dickert's got a good rush defense. They've got an elite pass defense with Cam Ward. They lead the all-time series 56-48-3 over the Beavs. They had won eight straight against the Beavs prior to last year's uh, close loss, 24-10 at Oregon State. Here's an unbelievable stat for you. and it, It's just so poetic with the, the end of the Pac-12 this year and these two being left out in the cold. Saturday will be the first matchup in the series where both teams are nationally ranked in the AP Top 25 wow. at the same time. I think this will be close. I think this that will be That is great, fun. but that's sad at the same time. But I think Cam Ward and this Pullman situation, I think it's going to be a raucous atmosphere. I think it's going to be awesome. I hope everybody watches and supports both programs here. But I think ultimately... Washington State gets the dub 27-24 outright. Give me the Cougs. Washington State had won eight straight in this series and before last year. Um, all right. That's what We've I said a... a minute and a half ago on this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Good point. I just wanted to reiterate that. Mm -hmm. um, keeping it moving, Texas Longhorns at the Baylor Bears, 14 and a half points uh dog the baylor bears are in this one and um i'm starting to wonder did we did we overrate the win over over alabama like it was uh it was a big time win but are we sure that means texas is like one of the best teams in the country just because they beat alabama like i don't know that they are well i know right now i have them ranked at like third like they they look really good but i don't know if that means they're just gonna mow down everyone they play they have everyone they play because they beat alabama i um baylor has not looked good to this point but i feel like their home crowd is like home field advantage is like sneaky tough you know like i think there's just something about this game that feels a little tricky to me so I, it feels like the type, type of game that's gonna be like 13 17 13 in like the third fourth quarter or something that B baylor's just gonna be able to hang with them um, you saw TCU went to the national championship last year, needed a, a last second fire drill field goal to uh, to win with no time left. I actually like Baylor to keep this game close. Texas is going to win maybe like a 28-17 or something like that, or maybe even a one-score game. They just kind of escape on the road. But I don't know. Something about it This doesn't feel easy to me. So give me uh, give me Texas to win, but Baylor to cover. Matt Green losing people more money here. Not only is Texas going to cover, they're going to blow out Baylor here. They won 38-27 last year. They played this later on uh, in the season. It was uh, November 25th. The Baylor Bears are on a downward trajectory, sir. They have lost prior to that win last week where they only won by a score of 30-7 to against an FCS school. Lost four straight prior to that, Matt Green. Lost to Air Force in the bowl game 30 to 15 lost to texas 38 27 lost to texas state at home tj finley 42 31 and then lost to utah at home too 2013 they're 0 and 2 at or 1 and 2 at home they haven't left baylor yet which is kind of wild through four weeks they haven't had to go uh, out of their comfort zone dave aranda's seat getting a little hot sawyer robertson one td three picks 28 of 62 matt green not the most efficient offense you've ever seen you talk about a rescue for disaster Welcome to playing the Texas front seven in this one. I don't care that it's at home and that uh, Texas is going to have to go on the road here. And they were in kind of a sneaky dog fight against Wyoming. Wyoming just beat Texas Tech, a really good Big 12 team, the two weeks prior. It's not a bad win by just struggling through that one. Rice, it turns out, it's a little bit okay. They just beat Houston. Like, Rice is okay. Your old friend JT Daniels. To answer your question, are we sure we overrated Texas's win there? No, Texas is a top four team in the country. Texas is loaded all across the board. Quinn Ewers is really good. They can run the ball. They have the dominant hog mollies on the offensive line, defensive line. Xavier Worthy is an absolute dude. Whittington, wh whoever. 
They are going to do whatever they want at Baylor. They are not going to be faced at Baylor. Baylor is an awful, awful Big 12 team. They're Ooh. going 3-9, and 2-10. and 10. This is it for Dave Aranda. They're on the downward trajectory. We need to change how we view Baylor in the direction of this program going forward. Texas wins big. Don't overthink it. Their line's 15 on the road for a reason. Give me the horns. Give me the horns. 42, Baylor 21. Let's just remember Tennessee from a year ago. You know, just because they beat Alabama didn't necessarily mean they were just this juggernaut national championship uh, contender like they might like they might appear to be. You know, Tennessee was still you know still had had their flaws, and, and like Texas, it looks like a really good team. But I don't know if they're just there. I don't know if they've reached the point that we just know they're bringing their A game every single week. And I feel like some of these games, and you're right, some of these cupcakes are like some of the more respectable uh, cupcakes out there. You know, so, uh, some tasty, hearty cupcakes, but uh, cupcakes nonetheless. Um, so we'll see. We'll okay. keep it moving. Those are three uh, bowl teams. No, you're right. Um, we'll keep it moving uh, for your classic Big 12 showdown. Oklahoma Sooners going on the road at the Cincinnati Bearcats. And Cincinnati's a 14-point home dog. And you know what? I'm not going to take them as a home dog because I think Oklahoma's looked good so far this year. I think this team, they're kind of sneaky. Like I feel like their their fans are starting to get a little loud. Like Oklahoma needs deserves more credit, you know? Like no, you guys you guys deserve as back exactly as much credit as you're getting so far. Like your people are putting you in the top 15. There's whispers about getting top 10. Like Dave Aranda or not Dave Aranda. Uh Brent Venables, like this defense looks a little improved and that's that's what Oklahoma's worried about, you know? And we've seen the big plays. Like when vintage Oklahoma is just 50-yard plays, you know, uh, taking care of all these cupcakes early on, putting up 50 and 60 numbers. So I think they've looked more like Oklahoma this year. So I think they go on the road and, and take care of Cincinnati. I think this is like a, a, a 42 to 42, 21 type of game. I think they really, I think they take care of business. Okay. I think Oklahoma hasn't been tested yet. They still haven't been tested. I'm sh I'm not certain they're not paper tigers to this point. Third in scoring averaging 55 a game. They've, really not played anybody to this point but dylan gabriel has got to stay healthy for a full year we'll see if he can do that um we'll see i mean they have like a walk-on stud at running back i think uh right now it's kind of an interesting situation at ou but let me see what this defense looks like but also since he's like a ultimate hot cold team where like they lose in really weird fashion they beat like i think that's just scott satterfield it's just he's gonna be perpetually six and six and take you to the gutter with him i'm gonna say Wisconsin or Wisconsin Cincinnati covers here I think this is going to be ugly and people are going to reassess their Oklahoma uh love a little bit here I think Oklahoma ultimately wins but I think this is actually a little bit messier than people think give me like Oklahoma something like 28 14 here 28 mm, what's the spread is it 13 28, 14 it's 14 it's 14 point spread you, yeah give me you call, you call it a push can't do give that me Oklahoma just covering barely or, or Cincinnati covering barely, excuse me. Sorry. <clears throat> so you're thinking like a 28-17. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. There you go. Um, our last one, going down to the SEC, going, and I say down to the SEC, because this is just about the bottom of the SEC. Although South Carolina looked good against the number one uh, ranked team in the country last week for a couple quarters. Oh, Mississippi State goes on the road at South Carolina, and South Carolina is a six and a half point favorite in this one. I um I think it's easy after a week ago to just say, you know, if you're just taking what they did in a vacuum, Mississippi State played number whatever twelve LSU and got absolutely boat raced, and South Carolina played number one Georgia and almost you know we gave them a gave them a run for their money for, through three quarters, so. I um it feels easy but almost too easy but I feel like South Carolina they definitely look like the better team right now and they're at home so I got to take South Carolina right like this this seems easy right I'm worried that it's too easy Well here's the thing for South Carolina and Shane Beamer It's early for a must win Matt Green this is a must win because if you look after this schedule here for them they're going to Tennessee. That's a night game. But dark mode, like I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, there's a lot of 
Tennessee players and everybody out there, fans, everybody's excited about the revenge game uh, in Neyland. Ooh. I don't think that's probably going to go well for South Carolina, is my guess to this point. Uh-oh. Then you get Florida, who may have turned their corner a little bit here at home the following week. Guess what? Then you go to Missouri, who looks pretty solid in an SEC East Star course that we talked about. That's not a guaranteed win. I probably pick Missouri right now. You talked about him. I didn't. I didn't agree All with right. that. <laughs> then you go to A and M, Matt Green. Before you get yeah. the break of Jackson State at home, I'm just saying like there's a path where they lose what six straight if they don't get this dub. I think this is a must win for Beamer to keep some momentum and keep the fan base okay. Like Spencer Rattler has been the problem. He played really well in the first half and he's running for his life against Georgia in the second half. I think he was fine losing his best player to injury and everything else. I think this is a sneaky, huge game because also Mississippi state's offense is broken. We talked about in the the recap show when their blowout to uh, LSU getting rid of the air raid and changing over that staff um, following Zach Arnett taking over and bringing in the app state uh offensive coordinator has been a disaster this offense is a disaster will rogers has not adapted well um you have fans chanting for the backup the former quarterback at uh vanderbilt last year it's not good this is there's no excuse for shane beamer and south carolina not to win big here um you get them at home i'm going to take south carolina to win and cover and they should win 31 14 something like that Mississippi State's the worst team in uh, the SEC outside of Vanderbilt uh, to, to this year. Back to back to normal. The, the, what we grew up with, Matt Green. Uh, Mississippi State and Vanderbilt fighting it out on Jefferson Pilot Sports uh, on uh, Sunday or on Saturdays at noon. But that's just kind of where they're at. And I think if you lose this one, you're in real, real hot water if you're Shane Beamer. So I think this is a sneaky. There wasn't a great slate of games uh, on Saturday. I would have this slop on because I'm very curious to see uh, what it looks like um, for both schools and uh, if Mississippi State bounces back a little bit, but also I think it's just a sneaky must-win game. So I uh, wish it was on Jefferson Pilot Sports at noon so I could have it on something else and uh, have that in the background while uh, Florida State and uh, Clemson are playing. But, you know, it's, it's funny because I win. feel like the 7.30 SEC Network game has almost a new become one. that. Yeah, because it's like that noon slot. I feel like people have started to realize that's a prime slot. It's like people are watching the pregame. They're ready to watch football. So like that noon SEC network seems to be a better game than the 730 that's going opposite whatever primetime ABC game. Like 730 SEC network, they try to hide that game. Um, But some people will watch it. South Carolina, we'll see if they can get it done. Um, South Carolina and Alabama, those are the only picks that we agreed on like a hundred percent. Like some mm. of the ones we agreed like head to head, like we don't agree against the spread. So it's uh we're gonna it's this will be an interesting week to see uh to see where it goes. There you go. Matt Green, thank you as always, my friend, and I'll talk to you in a couple days. Yes, sir.